program. Um, Rami Shamir is a Zuccotti occupier and novelist. His work has appeared in Brooklyn Rail, Evergreen Review, Spank Magazine, and Ad Busters. He is the author of Train to Poughkeepsie Underground Editions. This is what it looks like. It's Rami Shamir. Thank you, Margarita, and uh, thank you, St. Mark's, for hosting me, Stephen, and Luke uh, tonight, and thank you all for coming out. There are a lot of people in the room that are responsible for getting trained at Poughkeepsie here, but foremost among them is my mom, Mira Shamir, whose support throughout has ensured the book's publication, as well as my safe passage through an inferno-like experience to be here to enjoy it. I rarely say it, but I always feel it, how grateful I am for your love. Among the many prophetic one-liners that George Orwell would write, I think few are more important to consider than the following. First, they steal the words, then they steal the meaning. We have found ourselves born into a land where joy is a dishwashing liquid and resolve a laundry detergent. <laughs> Train to Poughkeepsie, the novel from which I'll be reading, speaks very much to this, the golden age of double speak. Poughkeepsie, spelled P-O-U-G-H-K-E-E-P-S-I-E, -E -E, is the seat of Dutchess County in New York State. The name is a corrupted translation of the Wappinger word Yupiquai Ipisin, which literally translates as reed-covered hut by the water, but which means something closer to a place at which the reeds stop to rest on their journey or a resting place along the way. The city of Poughkeepsie is no longer such a resting place, corrupted in meaning, it has equally been corrupted in place, and it is now the end of the line on the Hudson section of the Metro North Railroad. Poughkeepsie, spelled P-O-K-I-P-S-E, is an attempt to decolonize the word, and in so doing, to unclog one of the many arteries which once flowed through the human experience. The word's presence, both on Metro North tickets and in the title of the book, is painfully ironic. Since in both instances, one is traveling the landscape of the colonized. I can say with certainty that if we are to retake what has been lost, we must accept this reality. That revolution is only sustainable and real if it begins at home reinvigorating our words, reclaiming our thoughts, rectifying our actions. We must accept that marching with our feet to the exclusion of marching with our souls will march us straight into the sea. Orwell, for all his brilliance, neglected to realize that the human spirit is too great to ever be so flaccid as his prophecy implies. So I'm going to fix the phrase. First we let them steal the words. Then we let them steal the meaning. After all, we, each and every one of us, are truly unstoppable. And in the end, our resolve can alone bring us back to the meaning of life's joy. The section that I'm going to read tonight is available in the current issue of Adbusters. If you've never picked up a copy, please consider doing so, as this is one of those special places where contemporary revolution in words is actually taking place. That said, train to Dixon. The 
G line is not one of New York's famous train lines. When you watch movies from the 70s and 80s, you don't ever see a G train passing through the screen, threatening to murder you in the safety of your little cave dwelling. Even on New York City subway maps, it's the only train line that doesn't have its own color, having borrowed the sharp green of the 456 and muted it as if to show its own lack of consequence. The G line passes through none of the major train stations of New York. There is no Grand Central or Penn Station. There is no 42nd Street or 14th Street. It has no Coney Island to start at and no Coney Island with which to end. Of all the train lines in New York, the G line is the one that is most lost. It is the no-wither of New York subway system. Like all that which is neglected, the G-Line is burdened with a tremendous significance. A significance of space. I had never gone farther than its last stop in Brooklyn at Greenpoint Ave, but looking at the subway map as the G-Train heads to Smith and Ninth Street, I noticed all that undiscovered country. All that land hinting at its own galaxy of stories which whisper humbly into Queens and then disappear unmapped as if there were another world outside of here toward which the human story goes. The whole morning I had been lost in fragmented recollections of my life. I was terrified by the realization of what I had become. The train stops passed me by, Broadway, Flushing Ave, Bedford, Nostrand Ave, Classen Ave, an ad caught my eyes. Two smiling cardboard representations meant to be human beings looked directly at me. Everyone on the train was just a colored shadow, but these two faces were so clear, like they're the only real things left. Behind them, white letters announced, get tested. AIDS is on the rise. AIDS. I reflected on the acronym just as I had once reflected on the word Poughkeepsie. What are you without your body? I overheard some yuppie say philosophically as I was bringing her another glass of Pinot Noir during my later days. Thank you. Nothing. Our bodies are all we have. There was a plague that had frightened the race of mankind into an acute awareness of their body. It exposed the frailties and the realities of a physical existence. What had started as a fight for survival has altered into a myopic view of existence where your body is the primary concern. And the results of banishing the mind and exiling the soul for the autocracy of the body have begun to poison their way out into our fair American paradise. I thought about everyone my age and saw their faces filled with struggle and a sense of impotence. I thought about my most educated generation handed a crippling amount of promissory debt for diplomas then placed behind the counter to pour the miracle martini or at a cafe table to take an order for no bean vegan cassoulet, Rambeau's refrains and Plato's musings, now only pricking the failure of our role in the American dream, ever harsher, ever further in. The plague that haunts this generation is another form of AIDS. This disease is the devouring and weakening of the soul. What are you without a body? Well, what are you without a soul? A healthy body, flawless and perfect in its curves, with clean skin that's been smoothed by beauty products, and yet there is nothing inside but a soft scratching. What are you without a body? I don't know, I thought, looking at the large ad with its smiling, picturesque faces telling me to 
get tested. I don't know what you are without a body, but I do know that without a soul, you're just another television show. There was a plague that had frightened the race of mankind into an acute awareness of their body. They named it AIDS. 20 years later, a new AIDS stalks us, an AIDS of the soul. Bergen Street, Carroll Street, I am falling. I am falling. The light breaks through the perfect sky like an avalanche of hailfire in a storm, revealing graffiti as we open, rise, your and rise, eyes and rise, and then the panoramic glory that the G-Train provides. No more corporate bullshit as it heads in a curb. Fuck Wall Street to Smith 9th Street Station. Brooklyn below us low, Manhattan above us high, the water of the Gowanus Canal gluttoned with stilled indifference underneath. In the light, it seems so dead. This beautiful morning light heightens how much America has fallen. It shines without its promise across the land of the fatigued who are dreaming of another time and another spirit. That time and that spirit are dead. Their memory now haunts the dreams of kids my age with that nostalgia for something we never had. For New York, for San Francisco, for America. The morning light revealed the darkness of death. We are the first generation of Americans who are not American. America rests on no values. It defines itself on no precepts. America is and always was dependent on its definition by its frontiers, those dark zones yet to be explored. That's what's always made America a land of possibility, the promise of somewhere else, some wilderness still, where a person can go and make themselves anew, the ability to imagine such a place, to imagine it so much that it actually becomes real. I had learned about these frontiers in my high school history class. Most of us learned about these frontiers, that wild west, conquered and subdued by the 20s in the boring rooms of high school history class. Yet, even without a Wild West, America lived on. She even flourished with all the chaotic elements that come with a real flourishing, a real becoming. She lived on because her frontiers had not died, they had just moved. After the Wild West was won, the places of possibility move to America's cities. There, a person can go and begin a new life, just as they once could have done in the Wild West. America is no more because her cities are no more. It is gentrification that killed America's cities. It is the gentrification of the mind that has killed America for my generation. Those dreams set forth by Ronald Reagan in his second inaugural address when he promised to restate our values of faith, family, work, and neighborhood have been realized. A new America has been created, an America without frontiers. And the results of that creation are best seen in my generation. A generation of flatliners, a generation of columbines, a generation nothing. We are the first generation of Americans who are not American. We began somewhere and though we ended up nowhere, we will always strive to get back to where we should have been, back to our own promised lands. America has raised a slaughtered generation and we are that slaughtered generation. We are crippled children trying to find our way back home. It was a beautiful morning. The platform at Smith 9th Street was mostly empty. When the F train came, I knew that I must go home. 
I used to think that home was an end, a place where you go when the day is done. But home, like America, like love, like God, is a journey of striving toward humanity. It was a beautiful morning with a clear blue sky. The platform at Smith Ninth Street was mostly empty. Someone asked for the time. 9.03, someone replied. And David and I were on the L train going into the city. And there was a boy. And there was a dream. And there was a city. And I was standing on the edge. And I heard the clattering, the thunder and the clash of the train. And I saw two lightnings approaching. And then I looked at her. A shadow city. A shadow America. A shadow dream. And I took a bag of coke and opened it. But the wind dispersed it into a snowfall, and somewhere in my life the snow is falling, and watching it, I realized we are separate snowflakes. We are no longer part of the storm. I stepped off the platform. Somewhere in my life, the snow is falling, and it is the snowfall of everything I've been, and everyone I've known uniting into a storm. I am falling. I am falling. The tracks approach. The street below. 9.03. Morning horror of the metal thunder and the metal crash. I am falling. I am falling. No one can understand how Rob we felt, who is not one of us. I am falling. I am falling. Once upon a time, in a place far away, we were children. I am falling. I am falling. I am falling home. Thank you.